Um, my name is Graham Weinbrenn, and I always describe myself as a filmmaker. Why do you make that choice? Because I think of film as a generic term that, d that describes um, the moving image. And I've always worked in the moving image in different ways. I've never, that's always been what's interested me as an artist, time-based imagery, um, however it comes up. So that's why I describe myself as a filmmaker. Okay, and it obviously really doesn't bother you that it's a reference to a, a medium that had a film placed on it. I mean, in the sense, tape's got a film. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't say I make films. It's, a, it's, it's just a, dis I mean, when somebody asks me what I am, I, I don't say I'm an artist um, for some reasons I could go into later if you're interested, but, that, but I always say I'm a filmmaker. Well, I sort of am interested. Um, my name's Graham Weinbrenn, and I always describe myself as a filmmaker. Why do you make that choice? Because I think of film as a generic term that, d that describes um, the moving image. And I've always worked in the moving image in different ways. I've never, that's always been what's interested me as an artist, time-based imagery, um, however it comes up. So that's why I describe myself as a filmmaker. Okay, and it obviously really doesn't bother you that it's a reference to a, a medium that had a film placed on it. I mean, in the sense, tape's got a film. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't say I make films. It's, a, it's, it's just a dis I mean, when somebody asks me what I am, I, I don't say I'm an artist um, for some reasons I could go into later if you're interested, but, that, but I always say I'm a filmmaker. Well, I sort of am interested why you wouldn't describe yourself as an artist. Why is that? Um, there's, a, there's a kind of a, a value that's placed on being an artist. If it's an artist, if you're an artist, you make valuable, precious things. And I think that's the way people understand it. And there's a kind of, in a lot of places, in a lot of the worlds that I move in, I don't know if this is true in England or not, but I have the feeling it might be. If you're an artist, you've elevated yourself to a certain kind of position in society that um, I'm not really interested in doing. I mean, I'm interested in the moving image. I make things that work in the moving image and they affect people in different ways. And I don't particularly want to elevate my position to that of being. Is, is there an something art. in the um, is there something in the ubiquity of the image, or more to the point, in the um, I can't think of the right way of describing this. It always struck me from the beginning that video uh, was infinitely reproducible. It's very apt as a re reproducibility, and that drew me to it because of the reasons you've just talked about. Mm -hmm. Is there something in that making of images that does that for you? No, I, I'll, I'll tell you how I got there. I, I discovered when I was a teenager this fascination with putting images in order in time. So I was working with 35 millimeter slides, starting off with kind of my family's slides, and then um, I started making my own slide images. And I was very, from very early days, I was fascinated with the idea that when you put two images together or put a sequence of images together, a meaning would emerge out of them that was different from the meaning of the individual images. And that I kind of, I kind of discovered montage for myself as a very young age, just like some kids learn to draw, I kind of learned to make montage. And this absolutely fascinated me. And I made a number, and the, my first work as a, as a filmmaker, as I like to put it, rather than an artist, was um, slideshows. Did, 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 was there a distinction in your mind about this montage between Eisenstein's uh, linear form and Godard's vertical form? Well, at that, point, at that point, I didn't have any idea about this. In a way, I was discover. I think I was discovering kind of, we all right? Yeah, no, we're fine. It's all right, I'm just fiddling around okay. the technicalities whilst we discuss the aesthetics, <laughs> which is great. I think, I think, I think, in my teens, I was, it was kind of an Eisensteinian montage that interested me. You know, the idea that you put two images together and they make a kind of third image which is greater than the sum of the parts. And I was both interested in kind of watching the way that worked, but also I found I had a kind of funny skill for it myself. It's like some kids know how to draw. I was a natural editor. Now, I want to dive, obviously, at some point into high, high definition 
as a, a kind of almost like a therapy tool to get us around all these other issues. But as you talk, I'm, I'm thinking all kinds of little things I want to come into. One of them is that if you worked on 35 from slides, let alone the moving stuff, you're already dealing with a great de degree of clarity in the image, or at least the best that you could produce then. And there was also the notion of the timeline and the accruing of meaning or significance or whatever, which is all about the strategies of the artist and so on and so forth. But I'm just wondering about, um, let, let's, let's sort of cut to the chase a bit here. So you've invented with somebody else, I don't know how you want to frame this, please tell us, effectively a different form of high definition or different in that it accumulate, it, you accumulate the data in a different way. Can you just tell us why and how? Let me let me develop this out of the first okay. idea because I, I was I, I mean I can go there from there. So I started working in 35 millimeter slides and I made lots of slideshows. When I was in college, that's what I did: slideshows with music, whole number of them, a whole set of them. Um, quite early on, I had the viewer pressing the slide button, oh, so they kind of became. When are we talking? 1970, right. maybe 1970. Um, I was in college already by then. Where, where were you? Well, first I was here at UCL. I studied philosophy at University College London. Then I went to America after college, and I went on studying philosophy as a kind of idea it would be a day job for my work as a filmmaker. Crazy, right? I would teach philosophy in the day and go on making my films. It didn't quite work out that way. Um, anyway, so, so then, of course, since I was interested in the moving image and slides were so clunky and everything, started making 60 millimeter films. And I did that for about 10 years. And then along came video. You can see where I'm going, right? And I started making video. We're stepping down in resolution, step by step, <laughs> right? And what kind of video? Tell us what kind of video. Um, the, the early days, I think it was, it was VA. Well, the first things I did was I transferred film to video. Um, so that was pretty good. But it was still, of course, worse resolution than film. Then I started working VHS. Um, I missed the Porter Pack. I did a couple of Porter Pack things, but I basically missed that boat. Started working in VHS, um, Hi8. But then, of course, along came digital video, QuickTime on the screen. Tiny little postage stamp in the middle of the screen. So here we have technology moving forward, and the quality of the visual image getting worse and worse. Um, and then, of course, we got DV, which is uh, one quarter the color resolution of the 640 by 480 image. And um, all of this suggests that what, you, what one's doing is not making images that have visual qualities, but making windows into reality. Because there's nothing to look at. All you can do is look, look at the image and kind of see through it to what it's a picture of. And of course, our eyes are very good at that, you know, so if, it's, if the resolution is very low, you can certainly look through and see what it's a picture of, but there's no visual, there's nothing visual to look at. I mean, I've always had a, taken a huge pleasure in looking at painting, which is of course exactly about looking at the surface and seeing the image in the surface, and that's a lot of what the pleasure of painting is. Video, and you know, as the, as the resolution gets worse, that possibility gets worse and worse. Then, and I'll, I'll tell you the story later, the option came along for me to develop this high resolution moving image medium with um, my programmer collaborator, Isaac Dimitrovsky. He said that we could make basically a cinema, a cinema image, which is uncompressed, full resolution frames put onto the screen 24 per second. And as the, as, the machines get, as the computers get faster, we can increase the resolution to whatever we want. Um, and so that's kind of how it came about. I'm, I now have a system that plays uncompressed full color um, frames 24 per second at a resolution of 1400 by 1050. Isaac tells me that we can easily go to standard HD definition um, with the this. critical thing in this mix is a pursuit of color? Color and resolution. It's a, it's a pursuit for the quality of the image, really. 
you know, I mean, def definition is very important. If, if you're in video, you have, as a viewer, you have to kind of do this gestalt thing of filling, all in, the, filling in all the gaps yourself. You know, as, so it's, it's both the quality, the resolution of the image. You don't see um, scan lines in my images at this point. And of course, color. And the difference between 422 color, which is half the color resolution, and 444 color is visible. You can see it, and, and, I've, and my, in my pieces, I've kind of pushed up the color a bit. Can, can we unpack this a bit? Yeah, sure. Sorry, horrible contemporary phrase, but uh, if the delight lie in some cer certain circumstances in terms of appreciating art in the surface of the paint, so in other words, that the image might lie embedded within the form, with uh, high definition, we're talking about the quality of the image, but what we're getting is, a, seems to me, but do refute this, obviously, uh, a certain kind of transparency. So the quality of the image is what? Its ability to, be, to, to have a veracity, or what are we talking about? No, it's ability to have an experience that is about visual pleasure, where there's actually something that just by its very quality as a visual object can give you pleasure just kind of like diving around in the color and form and shape of the image. I mean, I don't think anyone can ever say that about an image on a television screen. There's no visual, pure visual pleasure there. Um, I mean, my example of the paint is really, it's, it's not about the, so it's, it's not only about seeing the, the object in the surface. That's just one of the qualities, but, but, it, but looking at the surface of, I don't know, Cezanne painting, seeing the brush strokes is a visual experience. Seeing the apples in the brush strokes is another visual experience, but you have to have a very fine quality uh, image, a very fine quality painting to begin with to be able to see the brush strokes and be able to get pleasure out of it. So for me, it's... I mean, there are a number of things that come up, but the big, the big issue is kind of the pure visual experience. I, I, can, I can give you another example. Um, one of the things that I think is really great about visual art is the best work translates all the senses into the visual medium, so you can feel in your fingers the touch of what you're seeing. You can see what it feels like and you can taste it sometimes and you can smell it all translated into visual terms. Again, in order to do that, what you need is some kind of visual quality. Now, I worked when, in the video and 60 millimeter film pieces I made, mostly it was about what we were seeing a picture of rather than what we were seeing in and of itself. And for me, the big, as the big renewal in this high resolution moving image medium that I've developed is the ability to look at actually what you're seeing as well as what you're seeing a picture of. And that, to me, is very big. Okay. I mean, in there, I'm, I, this is not, I'm, not being, I'm not trying to be tricky. I'm with you. I'm with you. I've got to, I've got to explore here. Um, because uh, now there's a word which I'm, my, my vocabulary is great, my memory is rubbish. But there is a word about the transposition of senses and how you might taste color here, sight, whatever, there's a word for that. Synesthesia. Synesthesia, absolutely. Synesthesia. Okay, so the proposition in the mix that you've just proposed um, is that art somehow works for the sensorium. It's one of the things, one, one among many. I mean, can we, can we kind of do a little bit of methodological discussion here, would you mind? <laughs> I gave a talk just the other day at the Slade, and I started by talking about complexity theory. And the idea is, very simply, that if you want to describe or understand any phenomenon, you need to list a whole number of factors, and any phenomenon in the world is really a product, not a one factor, but of a huge number of factors. I gave the example of the Iraq, how the Iraq war got into existence, and I gave 27 different reasons and if you were to eliminate one of them, it's possible the war wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened. And what we tend to do, and I'm no different than anybody else, but when we tend to do when we describe ourselves or our work or our history, is we'd like it to be linear. We'd like to say there's one thing that leads to this or causes this, you know. And we all, it's a kind of a human factor. So, you know, now that 
recently I've become quite conscious of this, so you know, I always want to say, yes, yes, you know, here, here you have a work of art, and to understand it, you've got to really look at a huge number of factors that brought it into existence, and you know that you don't have to do the work because all of those factors are kind of playing on you when you look at the work of art, and the understanding is not verbal, but when we put it into words, we tend to, and again, as I say, I do it too, we tend to look for one thing, one cause, one explanation. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to be very, this is, as I say, a very recent kind of way of thinking for me, but I'm trying to be very conscious of the fact that one always has a great number of factors in play. So, so yes, there's the, the synesthetic aspect, there's the, vision, there's the idea of seeing something in some, something else, there's the idea of I don't know, symbolism and process and, you know, many different things and all of these kind of things come together and produce one little film or one painting or one piece of music and when you understand that piece of music or when you listen to it and appreciate it, all of those factors play on you, you know, but then when we describe it we say, you know, oh well it's, you know, it's pretty colours or something, you know. I remember before <laughs> you dismissed my proposition of the not-self as the place where art happens as opposed to <laughs> the synesthetic, but I, I think that's, I think it's not an overture, I think that was the first movement, so I should <laughs> drift off into the second movement, okay. if you right, don't right. mind. Right. <laughs> okay, so you've, so, you've sort of, uh, maybe you'd like to cap that uh, with, um, you know, high definition in relation to all of that previous stuff, and how does it fit in with the trajectory you've always, that, as far as I understand it, you've always followed in terms of your own artistic endeavours. In other words, here's, here's high definition. And I'd like to just pull up Malcolm McGrice's uh, comment the other day, which I've heard before, but it's good to hang a name on it, isn't it? Um, the notion that, um, you know, digitality was the paradigm shift and HC is the cream on the cake. I don't know what Malcolm means by the digital. I, I, I know what I mean by it, and I think it's probably something different. I mean, the, the point about the digital revolution, if it is that, is that it's simply that w anything that we can convert to numbers, we can now capture and store and translate into something else. Okay, so that gives us a lot of possibilities. It's not a medium shift, you know, because then when you, when you output something, it's on a screen, and the screen is a medium, or it's on a piece of paper, or whatever. So, I mean, to, to me, the, I don't, I think the digital is something different. Um, but I saw an analog high definition system in 1991 that was made by Sony and shown at the NAV in Atlanta in 1991. I think, if my memory serves me right, although I don't have a comparison, looks much better. Look much better than contemporary high definition systems. You don't think this is the CD stroke, um, not transistor, um, valve argument, do you? you know, I'm just talking about my memory. You know, I, I looked at this, knocked my socks off. You know, it looked like a film projection. You know, and they had the whole system. They had everything from laser disc through to cameras. Did you work with laser discs at the time? Oh, I, yeah, I, I did a lot of work with laser discs. Yeah, oh, and yeah. was it standard def? That standard def. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I, I want to. I've got to pursue this because that's what I'm here for, really. And thank you for doing this. But um, this is the this is the same question. They're all the same question. I'm trying to come at it from various angles, but um, so what makes you want to work in high def, your form of high def? And um, what is it, I, I, just with a, an addendum, which is that obviously these days any artist worth their salt is trying to do some HD because you've got to be up on the latest thing. And of course, the conversations I've had with, with people tell me that they haven't got the faintest idea what high definition is in my terms at all. So, what is it in there for you? And what do you think is in there for other artists that might come across the clarity and the colour, although they can't get the colour that you're getting? What do you think is in there for the artist? Well, it can't be bad to get better resolution, you know. We, we always want, you know, to be able to make images that can show us more and that we can see more, uh, that, that can represent the world better and in finer definition. Yeah, it's, no, it's, it's all right, they're, 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 they're going. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it seems to me it's, it's quite kind of, you know, there can be no question that 
getting a better resolution is always better. You can, you can make things worse. You can always degrade it if you want to. You, you can't make it better. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I can't see any kind of debate there. I find it very surprising when people say, no, we like low resolution. Do you remember, do you remember analog slow-mo, the blurred? Well, well there's a, there's a, there is another, there's another question there. And that, that's the question about when you're using a medium that's not digital, but that has kind of physical chemi chemical characteristics that can show up and give you specific qualities that have to do with natural processes and laws of science and so on, like the grain on black and white, pushed black and white 60 millimeter film, and the way that grain, the random series of silver, silver um, particles interplays with images on the screen. People, you know, there's a lot of pleasure in that, and it's really, it's a pleasure in looking at the way natural processes kind of interplay with our image-making processes. Once you enter the realm of the digital, there are no natural processes. So you don't think that there's no metamaterial, sorry, I've got a grasping for ways of saying it. You don't think there's any metamateriality to digital behavior? I, I think that's the whole point of the digital, because all that, what the digital does is simply a conversion into numerical into numbers of things in the world. So yes, you can convert grain into numbers, sure. But you're, you're outside the realm of natural processes. What you've done is you've represented a natural process with a mathematical process. And then you can output that so it looks like a natural process, but of course it's not anymore. It's, it lost the link when you made that conversion to mathematics. Okay, here we, here we go with McLuhan. It's unavoidable for me at this moment. I mean, if the proposition is that the medium is the message. Um, if you strip, you know the big project of the truth to materials that we've been on for many hundreds of years. If you strip the material, the specific material out, and you leave the processes, is that not what? Could you not redefine digitality as uh, a medium in process terms? I don't think you can define the digital as a medium because it's always. It's a simulation. I mean, when you, when you look at a digital image or hear a digital sound, it is, of course, in a medium. But it's no longer digital. It's been converted into a medium. Um, and the thing that the digital, it's not a tool either. The thing that, that, digi that the whole work in, digital, um, in the digital allows us to do is it allows us to convert natural processes into Actually, I'm not, I'm not quite getting it. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Let me just think again. Um, we're looking for this kind of modernist search for the basic materials of the medium. And every time you try to define the digital, it disappears. Like if you say all digital images are made up of a grid of dots, you say, well, you know, there are other ways of representing things digitally that are not made up of grid, grids. Like you can define the shape of curves. You know, so, so that's not going to give you a definition. Um, however, there's a wonderful artist whose name is Jim Campbell, who's working with reducing images to the absolute minimal resolution. Like he has 16 lights by nine lights. Each of them has 256 colors, and you can see moving images in them. So you may think that he's reaching down to the basic the basis of digital materials, but of course that's not the only way that we represent images digitally through the grid, you know. So, so every time you do that, it eludes you, you know. Uh, the same thing if you try to define it through interactivity. Well, obviously. No, I've, got, I've, got, I've got an image coming to mind here, which yeah. is uh, it's a Woody Allen movie. It's Sleeper. He's just been woken up, and he's still a bit wet from the, uh, the hibernation tank, and somebody gives him a, fat, a cigarette. And he says, uh, somebody says to him something like, of course, they didn't know, they didn't realize how health-giving it was at the time. Now, I'm just wondering if the kind of archaeologist and intellectual archaeologist from a couple of hundred years' time might say, they didn't realize there was a medium there. You don't think there's any possibility that our present historical space may be prohibiting that? To... I, I think it's a different thing from, from, a, from a medium. It's a different thing from okay. paint or drawing. Or, I just yeah. want to give it quite yeah, a yeah. push this way. Yeah, this. yeah. No, I, I mean, I've, 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 this is a position I've held on to for 10 or 15 years, written about extensively. This one I'm not going to shift on. This is not a new position for me. I mean, because there was at the beginning, of course, when people started doing things with computers, everybody started saying, you know, what is the essential thing? How do we find the medium, you know? 
And, uh, and I thought about that a lot and ended up saying no, you know. Okay. okay. I think we'll pass on from that one. Uh, <laughs> but getting away from the high definition, no, I'm sorry. To me, to me I can't, actually, I can't, it, it's all in the mix. All <laughs> right. um, so <laughs> my next question is, does the medium ever give you calls to pause as being inappropriate in some way in terms of the piece you're about to make? And by the medium, I mean in this case, the use of high definition, your use of it. Um, uh, my, my high resolution system, my Limo HD system, I think is a medium. Can, can you talk to us about that and what, why it's got Limo and, and what its process is and its principles, as best, <laughs> as, best as one can? Well, unfortunately, it's, I have to bring up a lot of irrelevant material to do that. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. We've got, we've got time. <laughs> but only tell us what you want. Yeah. Um, tell, tell me what it was that prompted the, uh, I mean, because you could and probably do, I would imagine, occasionally pick up HD kit as it stands and have a go with it. So what's going on? Here? Okay. Let me, let, let, me, let me tell you a kind of a, a story about how all this came about. I, um, my main reputation as an artist is as an interactive cinema artist, and I've made six kind of major interactive cinema pieces. I kind of invented the medium in the early 80s um, before there was anything. Um, and the idea, the idea of the mostly interactive cinema work is about being in a cinematic stream that you can affect in some way. It's not about choice or you know, deciding what happens next or anything like that. It's more like you're in a cinematic stream. It can be a story and maybe you'll shift to see the story from another point of view, but the story will keep going or maybe you'll look back and see how you got here. Again, the story will keep going. So it's a very, I worked, it's an incredibly elaborate system. Um, we, we were, it was a multi-laser multi disk system. Uh, we had, to, in the early days, we had to design our own computer control switcher. It was kind of a big project. And um, I made six pieces like this, ending up with this huge 90 foot long tunnel in a coal mine in Germany with uh, projections on the floor and ceiling as you walked along. You look down, there's a miner underneath you. When you stop, he stops. When you walk forward, he walks forward. If there's 20 people in the tunnel, there are 20 miners underneath you. When you stop, they stop. When you walk backwards, the ground catches fire. But of course, there's a stream of people going through the tunnel all the time. So walking backwards means you have to break the rules and act kind of you know, against the, the system. So people, so people would stop and they'd walk backwards and the ground would catch fire or flood or whatever and then you'd... So it's, a, it's, it's quite a wonderful piece, totally megalomaniac, uh, 90 feet long, on, suspended in the air in this huge tunnel in the Ruhr Valley. Um, and so, so kind of that's what I'm known as. And this piece was in 2000, then along came 2001 and I'm sitting in my editing room on Canal Street watching the towers burn, I can see the people jump out the window. I didn't want to turn on my camera because I felt it was not quite the right thing to do. And I thought to myself, I, I don't want to be a megalomaniac artist anymore. It's not, you know, it's not, I don't want to act like these, I don't want to make these huge gestures. I don't think it's appropriate for an artist to do that. Um, at the same time, the Guggenheim had decided to acquire my first interactive cinema piece called The Earl King, which was made in the early 80s. And um, they said to me, we'd like to acquire the piece. It runs on equipment that's completely outdated. I happen to have it. And how are we going to preserve it? Because museums are about preservation of culture. How are we going to preserve it? And they said, don't tell anyone this, but our mandate is for 500 years. How are we going to make sure that this runs in the year 2500? And that was kind of the agreement. So I said, well, let's get a little money and we'll figure it out for you, right? So they, they, they got some money and we turned this from a piece that used three video disc players, a custom-made computer-controlled switcher, et cetera, et cetera, into a digital piece, meaning that all of those devices were, simula were made into simulated devices by a programmer I found. His name was Isaac Dimitrovsky. And he made basically simulations of video disc players, simulations of a switcher, ran my original program that spoke to all these simulated devices and put the stuff out on the screen. In order to do that, he had to develop a digital 
a digital image, imaging playback system that wasn't going to age. You know, and obviously every system we have now, we know very well, is not going to be there in 500 years. Not only will it not be, they won't have a player for it in 500 years. So he made an incredibly simple system, which involves very simply taking a bitmap image, because he thought a bitmap was the most basic image. It wasn't associated Could with it. you just deviate for a tiny second and just tell us what that is? A bitmap image means that you divide it up into, grid, into a grid of pixels, and you give each pixel a color and luminance value. And then you, then you have this database of, you know, 640 by 480 pixels, and you play back it one grid at a time. So each frame is a bitmap, and he puts on the screen 24 frames per second of these bitmap Im images. And so that's how the, and it, that's more or less how the laser disc players work, because each, in the laser disc play, each complete revolution of the disc, each groove of the disc was one frame, and so it moved along from one to the next. So basically, he'd simulated the Laserdisc playback system digitally, and, that, and that's how we got the old kit. And then in the middle of all this, Isaac, who is an absolutely brilliant programmer and who, who lives from his inventions, said to me, you know, there's no reason that we should be working in 640 by 480. Why are we? I said, well, you know, the original medium was 60 millimeter transfer to video. But can you really, you can really make it better. He said, well, right now, given the speed of computers, I don't think we can go much beyond um, I forget what he said, but uh, anyway, but he said, I can make a system that you'll just type in a number and you'll be able to go up a resolution. It'll be full color. Um, and so it's, it's not going to wear out, you know. So if you can have a projector that can play back 3,200 3, by 2,400 frames and we, and we can get a, a, a what? Pixels. Yeah, sorry. So yeah, can play back 3,200 by 2,400 pixels and we can get a, a hard drive and bus system that will be that will travel fast enough, we can do it that definition. So I said, okay, let's do it. And he'd had he'd done it already. All he had to do was you know was type a couple of things, and we had a system. Of course, there's no camera. Um, and so, but I realized that if I could do, I mean, there's no real time camera. Digital still cameras do much better resolution than I could work with, which at that point was 1400 by 1050. So I started to make this series of time-lapse pieces using digital still cameras. As a matter of interest, was it 1440? 1400 by 1050. Because you know there's this magic figure of 1440, which is somebody chucks away. When they, a lot of their cameras, they're 1920, but actually the first thing that happens is they chuck away sufficient pixels to get to 1440, which is, interpolates back with 9... 1440 by 1080. 1440 by 1080 is 43. The projector we have plays about 1400 by 1050, which is a standard computer resolution, not a video resolution, so that's why we're working that. But of course, I could work at 1440 by 1080, but there's no projector that does that. We like to be at the native resolution of the projector, yep. so that's why we're at that. So, uh, so anyway, so, so I started to make these time-lapse pieces with digital still cameras that are about 3200 by 2400, and then I reduced them to individual frames of... Um, 1400 by 1050 and they, and they play back and so that's why I say it's not an HD system it doesn't have much to do with HD it, the our original runtime and authoring system for the Earl King for these interactive pieces which were written um, with me my I wrote them with my brother um, in the early 80s in Pascal we called it limousine because it's the idea that you're traveling through this kind of database of movies Limo. So I stuck with the name. So that's how we got Limo HD. That was a very long answer to a very yeah, short question. <laughs> you were being wags, basically. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. That's really interesting. That's yeah, really yeah. Interesting. So, what I bring, do you want to say more? No. I, I mean, what that sort of um, was a bunch of things that are kind of off that. I mean, no, let me, let me not go there. Let me just ask. Uh, Let's just pursue that a wee bit, which is um, in in that in that pursuit. Uh, well, not, not a pursuit for resolution at all, but because you have that possibility. What are you doing, and what are you doing next? What's your aspirational space for? Well, for as I told you, you know, I, I wanted to make small pieces, so I so I kind of gave myself a limit of one minute 
and I gave myself a little rule that each of these pieces would generate a letter. So that kind of gave me freedom to do anything. And I blew up. I, I took some of my old work and made them into one-minute one pieces and put them in the system. And I went out and shot with Sony 900 cameras for a couple of pieces and kind of intercut those, although the color is, you can see the difference in the color immediately, um, intercut those with still. So, you know, I mean, the, the range is very wide. So that's what I'm doing. I want to end up with about 50 of these one-minute films. They show on the screen in a festival or something, there's a kind of a uh, icon grid, and the audience shouts out what letter they want to see next, so it's interactive. So I'm talking to you at a moment where uh, there's tranquility and equanimity about your practice, whereas I do hope to be talking to you at the end of my time, which is three years' time, about where you, where, you know, how long do you see this bit going on? Well, I'm, I'm also doing something else. Um, a couple of large museums in the United States saw my system, and they'd been looking for an artist to make films about their paintings, individual paintings, because they're just, they were getting a little sick of these documentary films about, you know, with terror, heavy voiceover and, don't, you know, and very expensive. So they, they asked me if I would choose, a, the National Gallery in Washington asked me if I would choose a painting and make a film about it. And so I chose a Turner painting and I went to the place that he sketched, the, the, did the sketches for the painting in Newcastle and I made a seven-minute film about this painting, including getting a very high-resolution scan of the image, a 5,000 pixels per inch scan of the image, doing animation across the surface so you can see these incredible scratches. And, and most people who look at this say they've really never seen anything like it before, and it's really because given the resolution, you can look at the surface of that painting in a way that you Each cannot. Yeah, it's all in After Effects. Yeah, it's all in After Effects. Yeah. But, you know, After Effects allows you to output a series of bitmap, bitmap images, so it's easy. You know, it's so, so is your inquiry, uh, it's, I mean, for me it's really interesting, because as a director of photography uh, going undercover for many years, um, I ended up doing the history of British painting, and mm. I got Turner and Constable. <laughs> I was yeah. asked to do, can you go and do a Turner on the weekend, because I had the camera back, because we need an end to the program. So I had to do a Turner which is interesting, cinematographically, because there's that practice. There's the practice you're talking about, we're seeing clearly, and the cinema, cinematic, actually the, the development of cinematographic practice is photographic practice to mind. Mm -hmm. but, um, where you, but the thing is, is you're interfering with the way that the image is coming in. But is, is your work, are you looking to do more of those? Oh, I'd love to. I mean, they are great commissions, that, uh, and they allow me to look at paintings, which I've always loved, in a very special way. Um, and of course, t Turner is about this too. I mean, Turner is very much about how you take this medium and capture light on water or fog, on, fog over, the, you know, over the horizon and, you know, and, and how you can use the medium of paint to capture that. And so you, I can get him very close to that and we can look at his technique of doing that, which is fascinating, pull back and suddenly this kind of blob of quite I don't know, um, illogical paint marks become shimmering water or become... Can we, can we talk about capturing? Because in, in the capturing, there's this kind of capturing, and then there's that kind of capturing. And you're an artist, so... Oh, sorry, you're a filmmaker. Um, <laughs> how, how serious is that? I don't mind if other people call me. I mean, no, okay. it's no, it's no. I mean, it's just when when somebody asks me to describe myself, I say I'm a filmmaker. Okay. Okay. But uh, you know, the capturing is the issue because what uh, what's uh, preoccupying me at the moment is that I'm I'm pretty fed up with cine cinematography. I'm fed up with it because there are strategies, and the strategies can blind the viewer, smoke and mirrors. But there is uh, capturing in the terms that you've talked about with with paint and. So I'm just wondering about the issue for you. So you're, you're working with the objects in front of, you're, you're capturing in, the, in, a, in, a, in a transparent sense, but you're allowing the things in front of the camera to do stuff that's captured in the painterly sense? What's going on in, in the mix? I'm not quite sure what you're getting at here, but I'll well, give it a shot. Well, decaying things, for instance. Yeah, right, right. We saw downstairs. You're actually letting the, you're letting the smoke on the water and the light in the physical Absolutely. Abs well, it goes back to the, one of the things I was talking about before. I mean, what I do with the still lives, this is a series of still life 
um, still life time lapses that I do, um, I try to set up something that's based on a painting or based on a series of paintings incredibly carefully, um, like a Dutch still life. And then what I do underneath it is I plant seeds or put in little bu bulbs. So I start off with complete control over the image and then I kind of let nature take its course, as they say. You know, and, and what, whatever happens, happens. So as the fruit rots, things kind of grow out of the ground and, um, you know, and they die as well, or flowers grow. So it's, I'm, I'm very interested in this kind of interplay between the controlled and the random and, the, and watching it how nature works. So yes, on, on the, I start off very much under control and end up you know, with whatever happens. But most importantly, you want to see this clearly. I, I want there to be a, I don't know if that's most importantly, but, but, but I've, I mean, I've, I've looked at this, uh, you know, I can, I, in order to check them, I have to do them in standard definition that this, I have to have a special setup to play this back. So I look at it, it's not very interesting as a video piece. When it, when it goes to full color high definition, suddenly it gets this, as I say, this tangible quality that is kind of, it's unrepeatable. It, grabs your eyes, you know, and, and that, I, it's, it's not a difference I can put into words very well, but it's very much something that you can feel immediately. Okay, I mean, I've seen this, I've seen, I know what you're talking about, everybody will have to see it to know this difference of the two of them. But just to extrapolate a bit and come out of that and back into the world of high definition in a way, the uh, mythic uh, exploration of 8K that's going on with NHK at the moment, well, actually three or four years ago, but this thing of having loads of data recorders getting out of the camera, and then this is all hearsay, but putting it up on a screen, and the audience witnessing what they witness, but actually experiencing some kind of nausea, and um, if that's true, I mean, that's what the reports say. Have you heard this stuff? I have, yeah. Okay. So there's something about, I mean, clearly our eyes are working way above, way above what the camera's doing. And yet there's something going on about representation. So about capturing and representation and the search for greater definitions. Can you sort of say, talk around that? Well, as I say, kind of, that's not where I'm at, really. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, great, unlike, this is kind of outside what your, kind of, your, your particular search with this program, but, you know, I'm not after greater resolution for its own sake. I just, I just want to make beautiful images. Even though I think it's fashionable to think about making beautiful images, in fact, it was very that would have been very uncool to say a couple of years ago. No, I think it's cool to say, you know. I'm, I mean, I'm interested in things that appeal to the eye, and you know, if this is how I'm going to get. Tell me why. Tell me why. Can we just get into that? What, what's this about? Well, you know, it's about that's a question of why one is interested in art and why one makes art and what one thinks art is. I mean, I think you know, it's about communication and capturing the human, the human condition and mostly about finding ways to communicate or to capture or express things that can't be put into words or can't be um, communicated in any other way. So for me it's about finding ways of dealing with things that I can feel or think or experience but can't express verbally but yet can somehow pump into an image or a short piece, and they, it comes out to me, and maybe it'll come out to other people too, you know. But it's, a, it's about getting beyond language and rationality and, uh, you know, yeah, communication that way. I'm now going to read a series of questions which may or may not be relevant and ask Graham what he feels about those. So, what I have here, and these, some of these are notes to myself mm -hmm. as opposed to questions, but it's a general mix. Um, it's concerned me for a long time, uh, Walter Benjamin's uh, thoughts and everything that came from that about the authentic and the reproduced, and there was a time where there was a decay in the reproduction, so there was issues around there, but of course with digitality there's a notional lack of decay. Is the copy as relevant as the original these days? That's one of the things. Um, human physiology, which we just discussed with the NHK thing. And Malcolm LeGrice's point, which we covered a little earlier, uh, that digitality is the issue and HD is simply cream on the cake. And ah, 
see what you feel about this too in the mix. Um, as a, as a, uh, I've just been developing this notion lately about, um, you know, there's been a fascination with user-generated content in terms of contemporary Web2 stuff. But I'm just wondering about user-generated technology, not content, but technology, and how this might be a time when we we'll come through corporation mm -hmm. that arc, mm -hmm. and come back to, uh, coming back to, because it would have been the province of the rich to mm. invent, but mm. are, we in, are we now in that space? And the last question, uh, or the last idea, is HD primarily a strategy for the emergent artist? Mm. So we've gone from Walter Benjamin, Malcolm Le Bryce, um, user-generated technology, and where HD sits okay. with all of that, and how you feel, and what you might want to say at this point. Um, uh, this is not, I'll, I'll just say it. Um, I pronounce him Walter Benjamin. Benjamin. Um, and I do think about him a lot. I, and I'm particularly interested in, in his idea of aura and the idea that with a original piece, there's some kind of connection with the artist. And that gives the piece what he called an aura, which meant that you really were, there was a link with the work and the artist. And his, and his question was whether photography could carry that kind of aura since it was reproducible. Now, in my view, there, there you, you can often, with a piece of work, make a link with the artist. You can feel the artist. And the most interesting work is, to me, the product of an individual mind. That's the best we can hope for from art, is that you know, we're seeing through one person's eyes, and each person has a distinctive view. And if the person's viewpoint on the world is interesting enough, then we'll learn something different than seeing through our own eyes. And to me, that's kind of at the center of Benjamin's idea. I mean, one of the issues about the digital, of course, is about value. You know, how do you, how do you make, how do you keep the value of, the, of works of art which have reached a phenomenal point now in a very weird way if they're infinitely reproducible? And the answer is you cut off production after a certain amount. Um, so, you know, this, this question about the copy, you know, so you have editions, say, and in fact, museums are only interested in works that are editioned as a collector's now. So the issue of infinite reproducibility turns out to be an economic issue in a way. You know, um, if you have a mass market product, then infinite, infinitely re reproducible is great. You know, if, you, if, you have, if you're trying to make a small edition for wealthy collectors and museums that maintains its value because of its rarity, then you have to pretend that it's not infinitely reproducible. And you've got to, uh, I mean, I, you know, I've, I find all this very troubling, but it's another discussion. Um, but I do think that we cannot separate the idea of reproducibility from the economic world. That's where it matters the most, I and think. You don't think about the HD thing is about amping the, uh, raising the uh, elite uh, state, because the elite states are what's the saleability, cutting off production is about the elite state, isn't it? So does HD get into that mix somehow? Well, not necessarily, you know, you could, you, you know, when they make Blu-ray discs, if they're good enough, you know, there'll be millions of them. You know, I, and I, I don't think that issue connects with HD in particular, but it certainly does connect with reproducibility. Um, well, the, the Malcolm thing about digitality, we, we covered already. I don't think we need to go into that again. Uh, what was the one after that? Uh, about HD as a... As a, a strategy for an emergent artist. Oh no, that was the tools, the artists making their own tools. Okay, yeah, alright. That, that, that was interesting to me. Okay, let's do that one because um, this was a proposition, I didn't know, I didn't know that you'd uh, created this HD system and I don't know if you know this, but there was this bloke uh, in, in uh, California, Jeff Crane's. Who, uh, I know Jeff Crane's, yeah. Yeah, okay. So. But he didn't, he didn't get his camera together. No. But he uh, said he would. I know, I know, wow. Red also, the red camera also said they'd get it together, and it's not clear that they did, but that's another okay. point. Um, I've, I, I've never had a principle about making my own tools. How, however, I always have found myself having to do it. Um, starting, as I said, with the Oil King, which was, in which we had to invent an interactive cinema authoring and playback system 
kind of from scratch using, a, using mostly available off-the-shelf hardware, although we had to build a piece of hardware as well. So, um, but, you know, to me, it's, it's very important to follow your ideas. And, you know, I try to tell this to my students. You can't take a piece of canned software and think it's going to express your ideas. The idea has got to come first. Maybe you'll be able to do it in Photoshop, and maybe you won't. And if you can't, you better make a tool that you can do it in. You know, so for me, making art is about, is about developing ideas. And um, at certain stages, lots of people make tools to express their ideas, and at other stages, they don't. Right now, I don't feel a lot of people actually are, are making their own tools because they're convinced, people are convinced that the range of available applications can cover everything. I know perfectly well that that's not true, you know, and um, so I think, I think it's important that one do it. Um, the, great, the great thing about the stage we're in now is that, you know, my friend, as I say, Isaac Dimitrovsky lives on the Lower East Side, and I can make a high-resolution system that looks better than commercial high-resolution system for very little money, and we just do it. I mean, I'm not selling it, I just use it for my own work. But it is interesting that I can go to a convention like that thing last week, Megapixel, and show my stuff, and the guys who come in with these huge, you know, projectors get a little shaken by me, you know? I mean, I'm not, I'm not in competition with them. But they get shaken by the fact that I can do that. But I think, you know, I think one of the great things about the digital is that we can do this. You know, I know a guy who makes um, tools for Illustrator, drawing tools. So it's a pencil that, as you draw the line, makes different length lines coming out of it. Things like that, you know. So I think that's great. I think more people should do it. I don't know if it's happening or not. For the emergent artist, I, I, yeah, that one I don't know the answer to. Is HD for the emergent artist? I don't know. Well, thank you very much. That's it. Did I say enough? Yeah. Is there anything you want to say? <laughs> no, I don't think so. That is pretty good. Yeah.